Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I'd like to welcome all of you for the uh, second meeting of our Data Science Seminar Series. Um, most of you were uh, there for our first meeting, so you know what this is all about, but I'll just give like two line description of what's happening here. Uh, this is a seminar series that's supposed to bring uh, together researchers that care about data science research, and because we have a lot of momentum and a lot, a lot of talent in, in New York City, uh, so we are focusing on New York City itself, and uh, um, we we're very happy, very lucky to have the uh, support of the three major uh, universities, uh, Columbia, NYU, and Cornell Tech, and we have uh, more uh, Nama from Cornell Tech, we have Chris Wiggins from Columbia, and we have Jan uh, Le Lecon from um, NYU that's helping us build this community together. Uh, and today, uh, we're very happy to have Deborah Estrin from Cornell Tech uh, as our speaker. I was instructed by her to give a very short introduction. We had this bargaining session uh, at, which, at the end of which I was left with two sentences to say about you. Uh, oh! I guess the second one should be your new name. <laughs> uh, apparently, as Microsoft, we gave her a new name. Uh, so. There we go. He didn't know I was going to be standing at Microsoft to have to give a talk. So, could somebody fix this? <laughs> anyway. Uh, 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 I'll yeah. Talk to who I am. Well, there we go. Okay, That's sure. Uh, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've started um, out of complete laziness and always being distracted before a talk one, comes. One thing. Are we sure that we have the mic on? The mic is in my pocket and off. Okay. <laughs> and now it is on. Um, out of uh, laziness and usually being really busy before somebody comes to speak, I've adopted this thing of asking people to introduce themselves. So you could say that you planned and that you did this. Uh, so I'm Deborah Astrid, I'm not that other person. Um, and that other person's name. I am that person. Okay. Uh, and I uh, came to Cornell Tech in January of 2013. So I'm almost two years in New York. Uh, before that I was at UCLA professor of computer science there for more than a, de a decade and a, at USC for about 15 years before that. I spent a lot of, uh, did my PhD at MIT before then, and I spent a lot of time at USC uh, at Information Sciences Institute, ISI. How many of you have heard of ISI? Cool. Um, and in those days, ISI was this incredible place where a lot of the pieces of the internet were being put together and built a lot of systems building, and a really great place to have students and colleagues who were busy building new one-of-a-kind systems because they were the first of their kind systems, and um, a place to just be sitting on this sort of edge between development and research and academia and not being very academic. So um, spent a lot of time in the ITF, um, started doing distributed sensing, what we sort of called wireless sensor networks for a while, and started a research center at UCLA under an incredible program at NSF called the Science and Technology Center. And uh, there had an opportunity to, uh, over the course of 10 years, 12 if you include having to pitch the proposal and get it past site visits and all of that, um, had the opportunity to work with scientists who were using distributed sensing uh, in their work. And so it was really became this co-innovation between the users of the technology and those of us who had some initial technological ideas that we thought were, were cool. And initially, those applications were our sort of excuse to do cool things. And in that time, I sort of, something flipped for me. As a network protocol person and having sort of grown up academically in SIGCOM and such, we always like would accept a couple of application papers almost on a, um, affirmative action basis, right? It was the only people who did applications were people who couldn't really do real protocols. And in the course of doing 
uh, sends, which is what we call the center, and working with these drivers of the users of our technology, I really just flipped and became completely immersed in trying to develop technologies with the people who were going to be using it. In that case, it was, sci it was uh, scientists of different types, ecologists, environmental engineers. And this collaborative co-innovation thing that happens when you get to do that. So I guess I became one of those people who was designing applications, hopefully not because I couldn't design protocols anymore. And um, in that process, I'm getting to the talk, uh, somewhere in the middle of that, uh, around 2005, uh, phones started, cell phones started getting really interesting. They became programmable and had um, multiple radios on them, not just to talk to cell towers. They had Bluetooth, they could talk to GPS, uh, they had Wi-Fi. And uh, actually through some interactions with uh, Nokia, uh, started looking at mobile phones in this mix of distributed sensing. And that got us into looking at, since I was still doing distributed sensing, and you always, I always tend to, can't help it, I look at what I'm starting to do in the eyes of what I was doing before. Uh, so when I first started doing distributed sensing, I thought it was about distributed network protocols and things like multicast routing, which is what I designed before. Um, but really distributed sensing had more to do with even databases, and certainly had more to do with statistics than with, than with network protocols, as it turns out. And then as mobiles came along and I started looking at mobile phones, I looked at them as distributed sensors um, and remain interested in them as sources of data, but they're much richer and different than that. So I will talk today about some of this work in what one of the main focus areas there, which is on mobile health, and how that's broadened out a bit to what um, my TED Med handlers had me call small data. Uh, and I will explain and attempt to excuse that sort of obnoxious term uh, when I get there. Okay, and then I was supposed to get to the joke, and now we can move on from the joke. Um, so I am, not, I am not a data scientist. So if you came here today, here today scientists, whatever data scientists might mean, I'm not what I, th what I define as a data scientist. And I count on having data scientists around and collaborating with them. So it's really important that there are people who are not what I'm capable of, who really are what I consider data scientists that I get to work with. So, uh, but I hope that I will have some things to say that might be relevant to people who are data scientists because it's an it's a additional type of data and certain types of applications that would benefit from data science. But I just wanted to get that clear from the outset. So there is this uh, very rich uh, area in which data and things around health uh, overlap. And Microsoft Research has been, I'm not saying that because I'm here, I say it wherever I am, uh, has certainly was there early and in a really big way. So Eric Horvitz and that whole group uh, have done incredible work on doing what I would call data science and big data, looking at data in electronic health records, in all kinds of uh, hospital uh, information systems, even beyond EHRs, and in web mining uh, generally, to look to discover uh, interactions and patterns, whether it's about which clinicians tend to have more post-surgical infections, or what are some previously not realized side effects of certain medications. And it is incredibly important uh, work that I'm sure it, we have just uh, really just the tip of the iceberg in that, in that domain and is super important. And not what I do, but really important and it provides context for other things. Um, another area that is really big data, big data science are sort of all the omics. Um, this gives me an opportunity to mention a, a, a piece that was uh, covered in a lot, got a lot of press last week that has nothing to do with the subject matter except that I find it really important and interesting. Did you guys see the press around artificial sweeteners? Yeah. So the reason you should look at it is not just because, how nice, there is no, I don't have to insult, maybe there is later. I don't have to insult my host because there's not like a bunch of uh, bottles of diet soda sitting there. Um, but the real, huh? They're out there. Okay. But, <laughs> but, the, but the real reason to look at this as data scientists is that there are two main people on that, on this work. I'll tell you what it is in a second from the Weizmann Institute. And one of them is a computer scientist 
bioinformatics, bio, very highly trained himself on the, on the bio side, and he works with an MD and a large group of people. And uh, in that work, uh, it's very careful, uh, incredible science involving both rats and humans, and a lot of data and a lot of data science, in which they have strong evidence for the role of artificial sweeteners in disrupting the microbiome and actually causing people to become uh, glucose intolerant. So exactly why people go for the diet as opposed to the sugar, it has, for some people, uh, the exactly the opposite deleterious effect uh, than you would want. It was all over the Wall Street Journal and everything. It's a really incredible piece of, pay, uh, 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 piece of work. And that kind of work, whether it's in transcriptomics or, 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 or uh, microbiome or genomics, huge place, again, for data uh, and computation uh, impacting health. It has happened, and that's, that iceberg is even less whatever. It's been a small, uh, even more of a small tip of the iceberg in that domain. Okay, so finally, what is more what uh, the sorts of things we do that are complementary to that and what I refer to as small data, and maybe there's a science around it, I just did it for symmetry, um, <laughs> is looking at not what you can learn from the collection of data across lots of patients or customers or individuals, but what you can look at uh, the data about an individual from multiple sources and over time. Uh, this is not instead of big data, but this is uh, another, uh, a very complementary thing. Now, when you have lots of people for whom you have many sources of their individual data and over time, well, then there is like a huge amount of big data uh, stuff you can do as well. But to start with, we as individuals, and even we as smaller groups, don't have lots of this data. We start with individuals, small number of people, for whom we can think about uh, capturing, processing, and using these data in extremely personal ways. Nothing anonymized about it, nothing de-identified about it. Looking to use it in ways to harness it for that person, in terms of some kind of interaction, in terms of some kind of, of care. So for this, we're not yet talking about having lots of data from which we can build predictive models to diagnose something about an individual because of something we know. We're not there yet. So put that aside, and instead, we'll, we're looking to try to say we know certain things about individuals, whether it's how people's multiple sclerosis uh, evolves, their rheumatoid arthritis, their Parkinson's, their migraines, their asthma, their sleep problems, their concentration problems at work, a whole range of these things. We have a certain theory that we take to it. And small data gives us an ability to look at those, at proxies for those behavior or to estimate changes in those behavior over time, uh, largely based on passive data sources. So how can we harness what is sort of previously unmeasured function and behavior to have personalized and evidence-producing care and behavior? That's like our goal. And yes, when we do a lot of that, we'll succeed, and then there'll be big data as well of this type. So uh, I took this slide from uh, my uh, colleague and co-founder of Open M Health, which is a nonprofit I'll mention later. She's a real doctor and a PhD, a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. And sort of this is a good overview of what do we mean by mobile health. The type of mobile health that I'm particularly interested in is where the mobile is in the hands of the individual. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff where the mobile is in the hands of the clinician. Either here, it might be a doctor looking up radiology reports or whatever, all fine, good, nice, not what I'm talking about. Also, the term originally was, uh, M Health was defined for um, uh, field workers and health workers in um, lower resource contexts, having access to clinical data and being able to log clinical data. Gr really important. Uh, area and also not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about mobile in the hands of the individual and based on a lot of passive and then some interactive and active self-report if needed. Uh, that's our M health data and how can we use it to drive clinical decision support, um, patient self-care, for which there's a lot when you're talking about chronic disease, and behavior change. And this is sort of going beyond this notion of sort of there's an app for that. It's not about any one app. 
um, that hasn't worked and isn't what works for, uh, for clinicians. That's not the way things really work in, uh, in clinical practice. Maybe we should try to change the way clinical practice works and workflows work. That would be, that would be good too. Um, but there are also just some more basic reasons um, that uh, just going after this sort of an app at a time uh, isn't, uh, isn't productive. So uh, we look at this, if you will, that health is a set of uh, feedback loops. Um, individuals, uh, whether they're trying to avoid developing a condition or they're developing a condition and they're uh, uh, doing the self-care that happens largely outside of clinical settings, as they're taking a medication and maybe is said, take as needed. Okay, so pain medications are take as needed. You have migraines, it's take as needed. Even an asthma inhaler is take as needed. So what does as needed mean? Um, and what works for that uh, individual? I'm also, um, well, all my life, I've only been in New York for two years, but all my life people have asked me if I'm from New York. Um, I feel perfectly at home here, I talk fast, um, I interrupt people. Uh, but I'm sort of also a Californian because there are lots of things you can say in California, like you can say um, maybe the person thinks, uh, 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 maybe the person is also including acupuncture and alternative forms of therapy, and you say that in most places in New York and people uh, uh, sort of discount it. But there is a lot of uh, growing literature in that space as well, and there's a lot of things that even the most, um, not sure what to call it, even the most uh, more sort of uh, conservative, data-driven, science-driven person, we all build theories about ourselves. It's just natural. We build theories that when we do this, that happened, and we have the expert in the room, so I don't need to say more about that. Um, so how do we drive uh, our self-care and our theories about ourselves in ways that can be helpful? And then how do we bring to our clinical care the data that can serve that a function. So whether you're being prescribed and your drugs are being titrated for depression, anxiety, uh, migraines, uh, blood pressure, what have you, let alone more, more serious uh, conditions, there's this thing called drug titration. Your clinician diagnoses, they choose an initial drug, whether it's from antacid to something more serious, they usually have a range of drugs available to them. They choose an initial low dose to be conservative about it. And you go away and you come back, it might be in two days, two weeks, or two months, and the feedback loop currently might be some blood tests. So for cholesterol, we're good, we have a blood test, okay? For blood pressure, we're good, there's a blood pressure cuff. But for things having to do with pain, abdominal pain, rheumatoid arthritis pain, okay, in rheumatoid arthritis, they can also check, there's the, 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 the test, the standard of care, is to check and assess the swelling and tenderness of your knuckles on your hand. Um, but for other sorts of pain, back pain and other things, they give you a back pain treatment. Just met, <coughs> was meeting with a clinician from Wild Cornell this morning. And they give treatment to people, maybe an epidural for severe lower back pain. And the person comes back two weeks later. They need to know if this course of treatment is helping. And the person comes back two weeks later and they say, so how's your pain? And the person says the same. But then they also find out that now the person is walking much more um, and they're getting to work and they're able to do a full day of work. And so their function is, is actually better, meaning there's some way in which this course of treatment is doing better. But if your pain is 20% better, how do you know that? That is a hard thing to know, that my pain is 20% better than two weeks ago, particularly when it didn't go 20% in one day. So can we do better than that? And we can, and we can do it inexpensively without a single new piece of hardware being designed, manufactured, or even deployed in the sense that we can start to do this a lot and it is starting, uh, it is starting to happen with just existing, already purchased and paid for hardware. Obviously, uh, largely talking about smartphones. So passively recorded activity and location, this is sort of old hat by now, but on every phone you can be running an app in the background now um, that is capturing your uh, 
activity accelerometry to tell whether you're standing still or whether you're ambulatory, um, and location data to tell things like what time you're leaving the house in the morning um, and sort of what's the diameter of your day. Um, we use mobile apps on the phone that, that can give other data and metadata and information about usage, how much you're communicating. And we, uh, when we're talking about small data, we don't have to just look at how much you're communicating on social media. That's important. And that's, those are signals in and of themselves. But the communication we do privately in email and text, I'll say more about this in a, in, in a moment, um, is also a rich source of how we are over time. Um, any folks who do natural language processing in the room? Oh, good. OK, Faisal, you see that. Yeah. I, uh, Faisal, a PhD student at Cornell Tech, um, works in natural language processing. And I made him come with me so he could find you guys. Um, so uh, one of my favorite richest traces these days, um, I don't, th and I'll say more about this in the small data uh, a part of this, don't necessarily come from mobile. And so I was just messing, mentioning emails. There's also things like our entertainment, you know, Netflix binging, the patterns of consuming, uh, of consuming different media uh, uh, games as well, and also our consumer transactions. So there are things that are really hard to get data about in any passive way. And um, what we spend money on uh, is an interesting uh, uh, possibility. And yes, real sensors too. So as there are real sensors, as there are new uh, consumer uh, uh, devices that come out, they are uh, good sources of data as well. It's not that I don't think they're important, but I don't think they're more important than these other sources of these software sort of sensors from which we make, uh, from which we make uh, inferences. They're certainly slower to evolve. So what, we, what we're just in the middle of, not by no means uh, uh, have succeeded yet, is trying to come up with really these behavioral biomarkers. So whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or migraine or these different conditions I keep rattling off, when you have a blood-based biomarker or a saliva-based bi based bi uh, biomarker, that is great. Okay, That is uh, quantitative and authoritative to the extent you, it really is a measure of what you're trying to measure. <clears throat> but for these other things that manifest uh, in our function, can we develop some behavioral biomarkers that take from this noisy and voluminous, for example, activity and location data, <clears throat> and come up with, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis, a marker that would give better feedback <clears throat> on how somebody is responding to a new medication or, or a new dose of medication. Um, in many of these uh, diseases that, uh, that I think are really ripe for this kind of attention are really uh, two, in, uh, uh, two in particular. One are inflammatory conditions where you, uh, the inflammation is driven by things that people don't understand very well, but it means you have multiple cycles of needing to titrate medications. So rheumatoid arthritis, um, IBD, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they flare, you're on some dose of medication or a cocktail of them that's trying to keep you stable and trying to keep your, you from a flare. But flares happen because they don't know how to not have them happen. And when you flare, you need medication to deal with the flare, not just because of the discomfort, but because of the physiological, physiological damage of letting that flare get out of control. Um, in, in rheumatoid arthritis, it's, very, it's, it's a very concrete. With every flare, there's joint damage that isn't reversible. And same sorts of things happen in other inflammatory conditions. So because you are going to live with the need to continuously titrate medications, having technology that can help us do that in a more precise way is even more important than something like cholesterol or blood pressure, where once the doctor gets you stable, you're sort of there for, you don't need a lot of titration until maybe you gain a lot of weight or lose a lot of weight or you know, age very significantly. Um, there are some uh, uh, products and things emerging on the market. Uh, one of my favorite uh, startups, how long after a company starts can you call it a startup? Uh, Ginger, huh? Until it dies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, until <laughs> <laughs> Good. So um, how many of you know about Ginger? OK, good, only bore two of you. Uh, it's a startup out of uh, MIT Media Lab and out of Sandy P uh, Petland's group there. 
uh, where our own Tanzim Chowdhury, before Ginger, was really Sandy's, uh, Tanzim is a professor up at uh, in Ithaca, that's our own, and she was the first student of Tandy Pentland's that really started in this whole space of doing this passive monitoring to try to uh, 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 characterize things around behavior. Anyway, uh, this startup, another great group of, of former Sandy students, um, is called Ginger.io. They're doing really well. <coughs> they do both passive and self-report on the mobile phone. They, uh, they do sort of big data in the sense that they, they do this for certain conditions where they have like at least a hundred or so uh, individuals. They develop models, their secret sauce, I have no idea what they actually do here, to develop a kind of um, alert or flare or check engine light coming out of that data. A good example of where this, uh, of where this is used is one of their early uh, contexts where uh, they worked with Kaiser Permanente, a large healthcare system uh, more prevalent in the West. Um, and uh, Kaiser had uh, found um, other literature on this that for diabetics, very important that diabetics manage their diabetes because if not, then you start to have, you start to develop things like kidney failure and things that are, again, hard to reverse. And so uh, they found that for uh, diabetic patients, uh, those who had um, a history of depression, uh, when they went into depressive states, were poor at adhering to their medication. If you know anything about depression, this isn't surprising. That's a, a, a common uh, uh, symptom of, of people who are more depressed. They don't take care of themselves and the things they need to do. And that's really problematic if you're diabetic. So Ginger built a system that opt in for the individuals. They run the Ginger stuff a little bit of self-report and a lot more of passive. And they built a model that uh, identified those who looked like they were going to a depressive episode. It brought up an alert for the nurse practitioners who would reach out and check in, see what's going on, and try to help the person, possibly with their depression, but even more trying to help them cope with adherence, with medication adherence in, this, in the face of whatever they were dealing with otherwise. Now, they had the set of nurse practitioners who otherwise would do some kind of random sampling and polling of the population. And now this let them uh, focus in and target those who were more at risk of, of, of problematic consequences. They're doing lots of other things. We're working with them. I'm not paid by them. I have no investment in them. But um, they, uh, it's a really um, uh, a very interesting uh, company and approach and just shows that it's uh, getting quite real. Uh, Tanzim, who I mentioned before, um, has a, what do you call that thing before? It might be becoming a startup. Maybe it's already uh, uh, a launch, but they have a, uh, something was an app. It won the Open M Health uh, Challenge uh, last year called Mood Rhythm. And this is an interesting complement to the Ginger work because Ginger is really for the healthcare system at the moment or the health researcher. The patient answers some questions and does some self-report, but it's not intended as a tool for them. Mood Rhythm is exactly a tool. Uh, developed with um, some folks from psychiatry and psychology uh, to uh, support people who have uh, who are bipolar, and one of the important things that doctors have been doing as a standard of care practice is to help people who um, who are bipolar keep their symptoms from becoming as extreme by maintaining a regular schedule. And this is, has to do with work and sleep and, uh, and other uh, uh, daily patterns. And so mood rhythm, both instead of having them do it on paper, which is the standard of care, there are standard diaries and things that you then bring in the paper to your clinician and they see you know, how you're doing and they give you advice for how to do it better. Now that is just on a mobile, that's sort of obvious. But moreover, the mobile sensing that I described for Ginger is going on in the background and helping to um, alert and try to drive people in a, in a, uh, to become more conscious of the fact that maybe they're starting to go into, for example, a manic uh, episode. It's not that a, going into a manic episode causes joint damage, but also for people who manage bipolar and who, and who live with it, it is very helpful to them if they can uh, get help and adjust some medications or, or support and not go into a full manic episode because a full manic episode can lead them to do things that, that they then have to deal with, uh, have to deal with afterwards. Um, this is uh, 
as you saw in that previous one, it's in part a tool. And there's some really interesting more HCI side of all of this, of how do we, even in the parts where you need to ask a question, where it's not passive, or when you need to be collecting some data to help to identify if your passive data is drawing the right, uh, if you're drawing the right conclusions from them. This is an example of uh, another uh, uh, Cornell uh, product from Information Sciences up in Ithaca. J.P. Pollock, who works with us a lot at uh, Cornell Tech, um, did his PhD with Jerry Gay. And this is an alternative to a PNAS or a PHQ-9 you know, nine point survey asking you about affect. Instead of answering nine questions, you have an app. It throws up each time 16 different images that are organized according to the two dimensions of affect. Positive, negative, high and low energy. You tap the one that represents your, your affect at the time. And you don't always tap the banana because the banana is not already there, or not always there. And they did, uh, it's published work from several years ago. They did side-by-side -side studies and showed it to be very valid and robust relative to standard measures. So there's just a lot of interesting places here as components. A lot of what we do is around passive, but I, so, uh, I find this idea so interesting of new ways of getting data. Yes, this is a self-report, but it's a different kind of self-report and a different kind of interaction um, than a, a standard survey question. And we're playing with that idea of also trying to see, can you make self-report be more contextual? Um, things like pain, you don't want to be asking around people about multiple times during the day. You're just drawing their attention to it. But if you ask them some other time, how do you know if you're getting information about that day when they'd taken a certain dose of medication or had exhibited uh, certain behaviors? So we're combining the passive and the, and the self-report there. Okay. So... A lot of stuff about different ways in which mobile can help in capturing data around an individual's health to feed back into the clinical care system. We want just one example in your head. Across diseases, just think of drug titration. Um, so I started out, sorry, the lines are really faint because I took it from somebody and they didn't give me the raw thing. It's okay. Uh, somewhere um, in 2010 or 11, I don't remember, um, that person who was up on Microsoft Scholar wrote a paper with Ida Sim um, in, uh, it was a, a position paper in, in science, uh, calling for um, an open modular architecture in mobile health. Um, the reason I suddenly stuck this slide here is because they won't let me use the slide I like to use for OpenM Health because they've gone through this whole rebranding thing and I'm not allowed to use the slide, but that other slide is the one I love and it's an hourglass. Um, and since I come from internet world, uh, an hourglass to me is the model of uh, how you do something that could really have impact in a completely decentralized market. Um, the hourglass, the internet hourglass, is that a familiar term? Raise your hand. Is internet hourglass a familiar term? Okay. Um, so uh, internet protocol, the internet, IP. IP is the waste, <laughs> not intellectual property. We're in New York. Internet protocol is the waste of what was called the hourglass of the internet architecture. It's this minimal piece that, of, that you have to agree on, a format of a packet and how to interpret an address. And what was so brilliant and remains so brilliant about that architecture is that it didn't say what speed it was going to run at, what the physical medium was going to be, what the Mac layer was going to be. You just needed to connect here. And it was able to grow from dial-up lines to microwave point-to-point -point links to 802.11 to whatever else has come along underneath it. And on top of it, uh, you layer the higher-level protocols like reliable transmission, which initially was part of it. But then Danny Cohen came along and was trying to do packetized voice over the internet. And he said, stop introducing those delays while you're trying to retransmit a packet. It's messing up with my real-time voice communication. So they separated it and they did a UDP unreliable, TCP reliable, and then all this application stuff, which usually initially was just remote login and file transfer and email, grew into all the stuff that is now happening. And that all happened because there was just some minimal amount of things you need to agree on, and then people could, with well-defined interfaces, go and do amazing stuff, which they're doing to date. Okay, so that's the hourglass is really the picture I should show. And what we've been trying to do in, in mobile health is say, 
look, no one entity is going to own this all. We, God forbid we end up with a, the, you know, I, I'm not supposed to name particular companies. So there's one really dominant company, not this one. There's not one really dominant company when it comes to electronic health records. And, the, and overall, the industry is dominated by a very small number of players that sell very large, expensive, largely monolithic, controlled, not modular, no open APIs, very little third-party software. And that's what has driven the slowness of our electronic health record adoption in this country and as things evolve. And in mobile health, because there's no existing dominant player to get out of the way, and all these consumers have different needs, patients have different things they need to, they need to measure, uh, there's an opportunity there to say, let's have um, some, uh, a community that defines the standards for what type of data is generated and how it's interpreted, so you can go and get your device and your phone from different places. It's sort of nice that in this, at this time we both have Apple and the Google Samsung thing, because it's nice for OpenM Health, because no one entity is going to, tag, is going to take this, this whole market. There is just built-in heterogeneity. And you know what? Heterogeneity is healthy and good and consumer choice and all those things. So OpenM Health is, um, in the mobile health space, uh, trying to um, uh, be a place with some very simple uh, uh, points of standardization, uh, simple uh, API calls using strongly typed uh, JSON, uh, schema language for defining the payloads, and doing this in a dynamic way, because we don't know what those payloads are going to be, right? Faisal's going to come up with one that are some features pulled out of natural language used in your texting, and that's going to turn into one of these summarized payloads. And you need a place, just like you have the ITF or the W3C, you need a place where a particular payload that, that defines a new behavioral biomarker gets used and validated, and then other people pick it up, and then better ways of doing it come about. And that's what OpenM Health uh, is. It's been seed funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and um, making good progress uh, of late. You can look more there. OK. So beyond mobile, yes? So what kind of buy-in is there so far from uh, the company you just mentioned? What kind of buy-in? Yeah. Uh, did I just mention companies? You did, actually. Oh, you mean like the epics of the world? Uh, you also mentioned oh, I wasn't supposed to mention that company. Yeah. God, you tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> but you mean those companies, the EHRs? Um, so, uh, look, if, if I, if I, ha if any version of success means that I have to, that, that Deborah or OpenM Health has to get buy-in from Google or Apple, then there's something broken around, uh, like, that can't be, okay? I don't need them to get buy-in. We, people go out and buy Google and Apple products and services, and we uh, layer on top of the data that comes, look, what comes off this watch is not particularly useful for anything, right? It, even if, even this, if this particular model had a heart rate monitor on it, okay, and every once in a while I took it, like after I climbed from the third floor to the eighth floor and I did a heart rate, a heart rate monitoring check, that by itself isn't particularly useful to my clinician. It's not clear how, okay, but if we have lots of its use and it doesn't matter if it comes from an Android Wear phone or an or an Apple phone, if the uh, cardiologists and internists start to say, okay, when you climb three flights of steps and take your heart rate, uh, we can now know that. We have these data streams. We want, it, we want people to get there. I'm entirely making this up as I'm going along, just to be clear. We want people to start measuring their three flights, heart rate after three flights of stairs, and we know over what time you did it. And we'll start to collect that from more people and turn it into a useful measure of something. And it didn't require any buy-in from the Googles and the Apples because, um, for the most part, they make your data available to you as the, as the patient and the wearer. And so you will be able to authorize, just like you authorize your doctor to get your lab results from another place, or your ex you will be able to authorize just through some opt-in things that those data streams can come down to a place that's going to process it and turn it into this now in the future standardized ways of measuring your resting heart rate 30 seconds after climbing three flights of steps. Imagining a blue for uh, sure, that's nice and simple. I don't know what all the implications are, but let's say higher to bid is yes. Okay, so just for the last part of this, expanding out to small data. So first of all, mobile health data that I've been talking to you about are small data. 
They are data streams about an individual that by themselves are useful, even without more elaborate models. Yeah, the activity classification that takes the accelerometry and says that you're walking, yes, there's like, you do that, you build that, you build that activity classifier using some very straightforward machine learning stuff. But that's like, you don't have to bother anymore. You don't have to bother dealing with the noise of location. You just call location API. You just download moves. That's like very vanilla already. But even in this form, all that mobile health stuff is data about an individual that given some theory about how to build the analysis to interpret it can provide value. It really only requires one person to adopt it. It scales down, and that's why I like it as a still sort of this marginal academic type that is doing things not from a power of position of being at Google or Apple, but just being somebody who's trying to do things with clinicians and, and patients outside. You can do something. You can see whether it has value one patient at a time. And then you grow it to more. And ultimately, there'll be a lot of it. But there's small data that extends beyond the mobile that I've become more and more interested in. And uh, really, um, you know, uh, very uh, new and just work, very much work in progress, is the opportunity to take these small data beyond the mobile, digital traces, I'll say a little bit more about, um, that um, I should have said a little bit more about. So what I mean are, might be data traces that come from your cable box or your Xbox. Um, it might be uh, um, data coming from your transactions, what you buy at the grocery store, what you buy from Seamless, um, as well as social media, uh, games you play, timing of it, and how long media you consume. I don't care about cars anymore, but when I was in LA, this was still a dominant uh, uh, small data uh, stream. I don't have a house anymore, so you know, appliance use doesn't matter anymore. So, um, But the ability to take these really rich streams about what we actually do and tie it in in a theory-driven way to, uh, to behavioral science. So both to understand what people do, but then even more, if you're going to uh, uh, build behavior adoption and, ma and management, um, drive it off of not just what you e try to educate people to do, like you try to tell somebody to uh, lose some weight, do their stretching, and then maybe they can reduce their dependence on pain medication, which is a huge issue, right? And it's not an issue of just weak people. It's an issue of people who are in pain, and they are parents, and they're working, and they're trying to be functional at work, and they're trying to be good parents, which is hard to do when you're in pain. And so they take the pain medication so they can cope, okay? And the, in order to do less pain medication, you have to adopt these harder, slower habits like stretching and yoga and sleep and, um, and, and these other things that are much harder habits to adopt. Um, but in many things, same thing for depression and sleep disruption, right? Uh, it's, uh, uh, and and uh, attention span and such. It's easy to say you should get more sleep and it's hard to turn the thing off when, you, when it's time to go to sleep, whatever that thing is. Um, so we're exploring how to use these other small data streams beyond mobile and as well as some things from mobile in a bunch of different ways. And um, not all of these in any way, yeah, I know, are killer apps or meant to be sort of the next big thing. It's just that from that time at, at SENS of doing the distributed sensing work, the value of driving something not just with, well, I think this was, will be useful. And so now I abstract it away, and that this that will be useful has this characteristics. And so now I'll go and design the algorithms to, do, to build this, right? Which is more usual, and it's, uh, uh, it, is a more, uh, it's, it can be a more effective and less annoying way of trying to do the work. But we're in such an exploratory phase, and this is also speculative, that it feels dangerous to me. <laughs> that I could go off and design very elaborate X, Ys, and Zs that has no real intended effect. So we're trying to, to really design little apps that drive and services that drive what we're using it for. So in this example, uh, Aura is an application that sort of is, the notion is to share how you're doing, not what you're doing. So imagine an elder parent who's living independently or a kid who's just gone off to college um, or a significant other who's uh, uh, somewhere farther away or just some siblings who you like to keep in closer 
that sense of them that you have when you're living in close proximity. And so we take ambulatory location patterns and Faisal's work on looking at communication patterns. And um, instead of sharing the details of where you are, uh, develop just a sense of sort of your energetic level relative to your baseline. And so just the notion of what you would see and what you share with others and what they see is just where you are in how energetic you are, whatever that means. How much you're communicating, how much you're out and about, and how, uh, and how active you are relative to your norm. So it's just this example, and it starts to play with some things around privacy as well um, in doing that. It's a much more selective kind of nuanced uh, sharing. And since you're doing it for yourself, the fact that this very private data is being used in it is, um, is, is of, uh, of, of less concern. You can really personalize what that looks like. It can really reflect you, but not in as much uh, detail. Uh, and so a big piece of this, and the reason I called out around natural language processing before, is, is Faisal's work trying to start to look at. So if you build a platform that lets you take in my private communication, I give it access to my, excuse me, Gmail API, and it's now looking at my emails and texts over time. And for me, like, there isn't anything more private than that, okay? So what this thing does is it pulls out language features over time. It only saves those features, and it throws away um, the, uh, the original data. And we can talk with Faisal uh, more about it. I'm just running out of time. Um, so intentionally, this is a teaser, and we're, we, uh, we don't have a... Uh, large department um, locally, and we really would love some uh, natural language uh, uh, colleagues on that. Uh, aside from language, my second, uh, so I've been in love with activity location traces as my favorite data stream for a very long time, but now it's, sort of, it's still important, but it's uh, just there. Now I take it for granted. Um, language is a huge one. We've only begun to think about that, the language that you can look at when you do it privately and for an individual over time. Uh, and consumer transaction is, a, is another uh, really interesting one for me because as I indicated when I mentioned the story about artificial sweeteners and being from California, this whole role of what we eat driving our health um, is a very strong belief of mine. In fact, I think trying to talk about health without talking about the food we consume is a little out of proportion. There's no number of steps you can take uh, to compensate for, um, uh, for poor nutrition. And, Unfortunately, we've created a nutritional environment that is really hard and expensive and just really difficult to uh, maintain a healthy environment. This comes back to behavior again. Uh, one one uh, project we're doing is called Pushcart. The idea behind Pushcart is to say, I don't know how to measure what you eat, um, but I do, in some context initially, know how to measure what, what you buy. And, and that's useful because if you can create a healthier food environment at home, and by having willpower once or twice a week when you shop, then everybody who's at your home and in those hours of the evening when you're tired and after work and sitting and watching TV or reading email or whatever it is, that, that, that the food choices you're exposed to when you have the least willpower could be generally healthier. So there is something to be said of trying to have a healthier food environment at home. So Pushcart uh, takes your, uh, once you sign up for it, your digital receipts from buying groceries get processed by push cart. We reach out to existing nutritional APIs, do a rough classification of what you did. And right now, we're just working with, we, we basically use a Wizard of Oz model where we show a, a dashboard to nutritionists. And they pretend to be automatons and generate recommendations of healthier substitutions. Now, imagine somebody who has, gets really, it's uh, January 15th and they start new grocery shopping for them and their family. They establish some really good habits, and they're really good and until family crisis, travel, whatever it is, and people tend to fall off the wagon. What's interesting about something like Pushcart is it stays there processing those purchases in an ongoing basis and might just start to nudge you back to the uh, healthier grocery cart you were doing six months ago that fit that fit your the palette of your of your uh, of your home. So this is really an exploratory platform, and we're looking and working with uh, behavioral psychologists and economists who are interested in different forms of nudges. What actually works, as well as just even the question of dietary, right? So now, based on last week, do we 
try to do substitutions that the person would stick to uh, for those um, diet, uh, diet sodas. And um, all of this, we build some underlying tools that we reuse across them to let us uh, safely uh, capture these data and do processing and build apps in as easy a way as possible. And so this reusable platform uh, we call Livestreams. And more broadly, and uh, coming to conclusion, uh, we're really trying to build a kind of a, at least a research and exploration ecosystem around small data uh, so that we could get access to more of these data streams um, for individuals and have more people coming up with creative ideas of how to put those data streams to work for uh, the individuals that share them. We're um, uh, thankful to um, some folks at Microsoft Research who also uh, contributed a letter of support for a big proposal we're submitting to the National Science Foundation to build an experiment, this is my last thing, to build an experimental platform. And you know, you might think it's hard to be, uh, and you, right, given current events, it's hard to be, uh, it's hard to be lots of things. Most people don't think it's hard to be a computer scientist, but when there's flux and dynamics in any industry, right, um, well, it's also, uh, uh, when you're an academic computer scientist and pretty experimental, and you look at these big companies and startups who are doing amazing things and have large amounts of resources and big groups and real data sets from products and things like that, it can be a little daunting. Like, what can I do with the little bit of data that I have? And, um, and one of the things that we really think we can do here that complements what goes on in, in industry is that we can go and do things under IRB with recruiting people in and consenting them into studies and inclusion criteria and safeguards on their data without, uh, without the same product and legal repercussions that a big company could do. So most big companies have to be, uh, uh, do, go to great efforts to be really careful about the private data they collect around individuals and not to be creepy and not to use it, let alone to go off and do experiments on how to be incredibly personal and intimate with it. And so we're working with uh, folks and thinks we can you know, really support being able to do experiments at the scale of hundreds or thousands of individuals where we really get in and say, look, well, you join in an experiment where we're going to be mining your data for you, giving you this, this feedback to drive these different sorts of applications in a way that it's difficult for the uh, commercial companies themselves to go there. And um, we're uh, excited about uh, that uh, possibility. So with that, there's some of the stuff is on our uh, website. And last time you heard about from more about Cornell Tech, uh, please come and visit, meet with our students, advise our students. Um, we need you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I don't think that most people are quantified selfers and have the time to literally see their data, so I didn't make this clear. You'll experience your data because it's going to drive some app you're using. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so where does the clinician come in? So the clinician doesn't always come in. There's a fair amount that an individual has to do for themselves, and in all those moments you're not seeing your clinician. Um, but particularly through OpenM Health, we're working to have these data streams turned in and these behavioral marker, biomarkers by doing the, the RCTs and the research to show that this is a good measure for X and progression of disease. Then this comes down and ends up in, your, in the EHR. It ends up in electronic health record. And the, if we, we don't do that in order to experiment with it because it's just too cumbersome. But ultimately, when you figured out mm -hmm. this is a useful, it's like a lab, you know, a blood result, this becomes the standard of care that looking at this data during a clinical visit or looking for this, that the nurse practitioners are looking for red alerts in between visits because maybe somebody needs to, to come in uh, sooner, 
that that becomes the standard of care. That data has to come into the EHR because that's the workflow. Ethical. Yeah, ethical question. So uh, I guess there are two sub questions. Firstly, who owns You get one of them. Ask the more important one. Oh, the more important one? Okay. So you said with Ginger, dot, with, with yeah. Ginger that they have some secret sauce attached yes. underneath, the, underneath the hood. Um, so one of, the, one of the reasons that we have the regulatory framework for the medical industry that we have at the moment is not just that we value safety, but also to a certain extent we value openness. And there are different ways of treating IP, right? something as a, as a trade secret and never talk to them about, yeah. about it, or you mm -hmm. can patent it, and then eventually, well, firstly, the, the process becomes public, and then eventually it becomes publicly available. Yeah. So uh, where do you see, well, I guess, but if you don't have any protection of IP, you get no products, and then people oh, sure. can't experience but, them. But there are different ways of doing it. Yes. Right? And, and I, I didn't mean that they're doing it any differently than Medtronics is doing whatever is in the device that gets implanted in you. Yeah. But it's not any more secret than that. It's just it's more the, secret than I, academics. I don't know how it works in the US, but the regulation of medical devices and yeah. drugs is not quite the same. You're probably in territory that I couldn't answer. I think it's, it, it is an interesting question. Like if some determination and care is going to be delivered based on this thing, shouldn't I get to know what it is? It's more important than knowing like why this search result was given to me. I think that is a really interesting question. I don't have an answer. Yeah. So related to the first question, um, and this, this, is, this is a physician question basically. Not the, uh, if you're going to do, if you're going to turn this into something that's quantitative, physicians like to treat numbers. I guess is the first point. So that it's, you know, you have to give them something to treat that's not a soft metric. And of this course. Is, this is all about, right. so yes. So the question is, are, are you, who is, have studies started that are going to try to collect data, prospective data, so that this becomes a yes. quantitative model? Yes, that's the state that everything is in. Whether it's with uh, RA folks or lupus folks or pain med folks is, uh, collecting data initially on 10 or 20 patients as they're going through just to see does this show any signal and then you expand it and you correlate it with the lab results like absolutely and this is a slow arduous process and we're not going to see it in care until all those steps happen but we also won't see it being very good if all they're doing is doing it with text messaging meaning getting them to start doing it with more modern approaches is sort of where things are now. Um, pediatrics. So uh, most people ask me that question with that tone of voice about geriatrics, not pediatrics. So it, that's Geriatric. interesting. Okay. Well, I, would, I, would, I don't. I would add, <laughs> the same sort of so uh, <laughs> with not a, a, I, the more productive place to begin is with digital natives, which are not geriatrics. Uh, the, today's, you know, when I get there. There is no one more digitally. I will. I will be right. So, um, with for pediatrics, um, <laughs> for pediatrics, I would start with parents, and do other things. There was one woman who uh, was working with me at UCLA who was doing um, uh, Fitbit for. I'm doing this for a reason for uh, hyperactivity. You know, looking if she could pick up signals for more, seeing if 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 teachers were over diagnosing or whatever the story was. So, I'm not saying there isn't, but there's so much to do with these with you know folks from when they're 10 to 60 when this is just such a natural thing already and this that it's just gonna happen there first yes uh, Duncan Watts, Microsoft. Um, uh, you said at some point that there were two classes of, of, uh, of conditions that for which this and then only named one didn't I and you said and then you just thank you inflammatory and yeah. mental health, mental health yeah, okay and the third one that isn't a class of condition is really behavioral Thing. So when you're trying to help people, uh, and this doesn't necessarily have to do anything with health, okay? So there's inflammatory conditions because you just have lots of this and it's not nicely periodic and no one understands it. 
mental health because we don't have the biomarkers of any other uh, of any other kind how people are are feeling and then the behavioral opportunities there whether you're trying to um, help people to adopt these harder behaviors to adopt that lead them to being healthier or prevent them from being sicker or maybe we're talking about uh, time management or quantified student or just people managing busyness or anger at their kids or what have you, right? There's just a, s a host of other things that because we can close that feedback loop around behavioral interventions are interesting, or grocery shopping. So, thank you. Uh, You're telling me to stop? Well, no, I oh, was okay. actually wanting to yes. ask a question. Yes. Uh, Jenna Amzak from uh, Microsoft Research as well. Uh, uh, I, so you, you did mention some intriguing data sets like, you know, we'll use Netflix and what movies you're vi vi viewing and so forth, but it's kind of not quite clear to me when you're in the small data world, yes. you don't have the link between these things and actual you know, metrics in, in, in health, how you would actually use okay. that in it. Okay, two things. Again, just I want to stop a word you used. You said data sets, okay. and we almost never have data sets. Okay. We maybe have data streams okay. about an individual. Okay. Um, it's nice if we can get data sets because then we can try to develop some better models. But by and large, we have data streams from an individual. But that's not where you were going. Yeah. I got distracted. Sorry. You were going to like, like uh, so. It, it is for me. It's not clear how. Do you want me to connect it to Netflix for Netflix, for example? Uh, Netflix and health. I don't know how you, they would, you would actually connect that. Ah, okay. So let's talk about sleep. Okay. 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 Increasingly getting attention when it comes to health from even things like people have done research about uh, chronic sleep disruption uh, causes uh, the pancreas to start to look diabetic that has seems to have some impact on the islet cells and it, it is one of those things that may be leading to increased diabetes let alone attention depression all these other things associated with with sleep okay so how do you help people sleep better and one of the big issues the biggest issue with sleep is actually getting to it and what you do in the time before sleep so there's all this stuff about blue light things right and when you're tired and exhausted not looking at that automatically provided next episode mm -hmm. of Netflix okay and your phone and your iPad with just a little data collection under that has that right so how do you close that loop for yourself it's a ridiculous and embarrassing behavior most of us in, in, engage in it in some way and so an app that sort of is helpful in reminding me, connecting me to that, turning it off, what have you. You can, or, and what if we just wanted to first do the science of understanding if it really mattered or, you know, how bad is it that it auto gives you the next episode versus not? Would that one little change of it not automatically giving you the next episode be something you could enable on your device? the privacy of the small data yeah so it's kind of like small it's more identifiable so for example like my heart blood pressure i just want my doctor to know not like other doctors or other my parents know the kind of blood pressure yeah pressure. so how do you like manage privacy of the data you require yes so um a lot of the data we use so let's, n I'm not going to go with your particular example for the moment of, 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 uh, of your blood pressure or your heart rate. Uh, I'm going to go with the other ones I mentioned, your every moment's location, whether you're moving or not, whether you're watching Netflix, and what you're saying in your email and text. Okay? Those data are not new. They are already being collected. Okay? They already, by some definition of the word, aren't private, but actually the services that provide them to you are working hard to try to keep them private. Okay, so um, we are saying let you as an individual have access to that data stream or features of that data stream to be able to now drive some applications for you. Now there is a security issue, okay, which is that in pulling that data out so that my apps can get to it, that's like very private data about me and I want that to be secure and to have usable kinds of access controls around it, the same kind of great usability and access controls we have on our smartphones, right, said sarcastically. <laughs> um, so we have, just like with the accept, accept, accept,
to an app that we want to use right then because someone told us it was cool. We have the same issue with respect to these data that need to sit in an, an encrypted container securely in the cloud someplace. All kinds of questions of what is privacy, what do privacy controls look like there so that I'm not just doing except, I mean, it's a big design issue around it. Um, and, uh, but in some sense, and I'll end with this, is there is a, um, a, a, a balancing that I believe comes with transparency. And the bigger privacy that I worry about is everything that we don't, that people just don't know is known, the people in this room know. But if you just look at the last, whether it's, you know, the Facebook experiment or the Snowden, right, it was a little surprising that people were so surprised. It's not healthy to live in a world where people are surprised. People should know, and people should be able to use their data for other things as well. So I, I used to call this privacy, and then I went to a meeting in Europe, and I was like tarred and feathered. I don't use, it's not, a, it's not a privacy move, but I think there is something in the power relationship with respect to our data. And yes, we need to do it in secure ways, and there's a lot of research to be done in the HCI and UX of privacy. Thank you very much, Dr.